you all for coming. Uh, time is very valuable for everybody, so I certainly appreciate you uh, spending the next 45 minutes-ish with, uh, with me to discuss advancements in single-use pumps. I want to go through the goals first. So ultimately, the, the goals for this presentation for today is really to provide relevant testing data uh, across a whole range of industry single-use pumps uh, to use as the basis for equipment selection uh, based off of what your process requirements are. The goals of the presentation are also to provide an independent assessment of existing design gaps that have uh, been addressed by the current commercial single pump offerings, as well as I want to make sure that it's very clear that I'm not here to promote anybody's specific technology. I'm not here to, to wear a, well, um, uh, the, the, the colors of any uh, of these companies. What I'm trying to do and what the ultimate goal of this uh, presentation is, is to, is to show worth what the actual data set is that's uh, been generated as a result of t uh, relevant testing for um, comparative uh, pumps that are available in the industry right now from, from a single-use perspective. So the advancements in single-use pumps. So at least if you look at, uh, look at some of the, um, uh, the, the gaps that used to exist in, in, in traditional pump design, right? So you would have uh, maybe a variability of installation. You maybe would have some, uh, um, you would have some integrity failures over time. You would have tubing uh, spallation related concerns where you would end up with downstream filtration that would, uh, would, would clog and end up binding up, resulting in, in high pressure. Ultimately, these are uh, pieces of equipment that are going to be used by manufacturing operators, and those manufacturing operators have to have a means to have a consistent, repeatable, and robust methodology for installation and removal and its use. It needs to be simplistic. It also needs to serve the fun function and purpose as was outlined by the uh, process requirements and satisfied by the design. So the ease of operation, being able to move it around, the weights, the sounds, being able to talk in the manufacturing space uh, while, while, while in operation, all of these are being addressed by a multitude of, uh, of, of, of offerings in the, in the marketplace currently, and uh, um, we're going to go over a few of those right now. So, why am I standing up here talking to you about this? Well, I'm part of uh, PDS Sandbox, my name is Mark Miguelios, and uh, as the founder of PDS Sandbox, what our goal and what our mission and vision uh, is, uh, is for Sandbox is to provide an independent body to do relevant testing for single-use components. It's a 10,000 square foot uh, process and product development space that's, uh, that provides uh, pilot and analytical um, uh, services to biotech, pharma, um, as well as, uh, the, uh, as, well as um, analytical testing for relevance, single-use uh, technology testing, such as use P85 for bacterial toxin, 788 for uh, Subvisible particulate generation and uh, we, uh, so on and so forth. We're a developer of uh, practical applications, uh, so we work with several uh, senior suppliers as well as end users to provide um, with what we can, would consider a, you know, a, a state of the art uh, uh, technology, as well as um, just because we're saying that we're at a pilot scale level and benchtop. We can actually uh, now with new capabilities, we're actually able to go up to a 3,000 liter scale. So. We have run a multitude of testing on, on uh, using uh, Watson Marlow's quantum pump, the Levitronics uh, Pure Lev 200, and the Quattroflow uh, 1200 as well. So in the positive displacement world, right, there's certainly the peristaltic and metering options, and those options, you know, uh, I, I think everyone here is mo uh, mo you know, very familiar with, with Watson Marlow as well as with uh, Masterflex, and uh, you know, Quantex is a, is a newer company that has a full um, single use design, but ultimately there's, there's the, 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 uh, the Watson Marlow um, 300 series through the, the 700 series right now is, is really kind of the, it, it, it's the majority of the, of the uh, systems that we see out in the marketplace, especially uh, well relevant to New England, uh, uh, the Southeast, and in, uh, and in Ireland. In terms of the, the diaphragm pump options in the market, you know, there's really uh, the quaternary pump from, uh, from PSG Dover to Quattroflow. And then there's a competitor from uh, Denmark called uh, Pump Cell that's also um, starting to uh, uh, compete with, uh, with the market, uh, with, with Quattroflow's market share currently. The centrifugal options uh, for, for pumps that are fully single use, uh, flow path, uh, there's the Levitronics uh, tests that we've run on the 30i, the, the 200, the 600, and the 2000. And, uh, and then there's a competitor to this, which is the, uh, the, the Trumo, uh, CapOx, uh, and, and the Siren system. So as you can see, 
there's every market has a competitor. Every system and every type of pump has a competition. What we've tested in the test in the data that you're going to see in a second here was the Quattroflow, the Levitronics. Uh, sorry, the Quattroflow uh, QF 1200, the Levitronics 200 SU, uh, Pure Lev 200 SU, and the uh, and the Quantum Pump from Watson. So we're at a point right now where several of our uh, end users come to us with uh, with with like, you know, what is the best pump that you see in the industry right now, and or what's the best bag film or what's the best uh, uh, filter that you've seen or tubing. And my response is always the same: What's your requirements? If you can tell me what your requirements are. Maybe all of them fit it. Maybe two of them fit it. Maybe none of them, none of them fit it. But it's not about opinions. It's not about anything uh, personal. It's about having the data to support the application. So understand the process requirements, and uh, it would make your lives a lot easier too if you're on the single use supplier side to have a to have uh, have your end user come to you with all of the requirements, whether it's low spallation, whether it's uh, whether, whether it's a, um, a high pressure, whether it's a, a cold run application, it would be far easier for um, uh, to identify what the appropriate uh, uh, technology would be in order to satisfy those requirements. And then ultimately, once you've identified your process requirements, pretty simple risk assessment here, right? So how well is the single technology solution that you've uh, selected satisfy your process requirements, right? So your solutions must satisfy your requirements, but if you don't have requirements, then it's very hard to satisfy those. Ultimately, when we're looking at the testing, when we're uh, conducting testing for uh, across a range of equipment, uh, we're looking at the technical part of it first, and then we go into the business and the quality aspects afterwards. What, is that, what that means is that even though there might be the most amazing technology out there, if you can't purchase it or if it's cost prohibitive, if there is a, um, if, if, the, uh, if the quality uh, has a, doesn't have a very robust vendor change notification program, if there's uh, inconsistency in where the raw materials are being sourced from, all of those on the quality side can end up being pretty problematic. So when we're looking at the testing that we're conducting, we look at it from a te technological perspective first, and then before we go to our end users, which right now uh, is around 38 uh, end users across the, across, the, uh, well, across, the, across the globe right now, out of all those folks that, we are, that we're working with, um, that business quality and technical aspect for us is, 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 is paramount. So what did we have? One of the tests that we ended up conducting was that we were running a pump comparison testing and the, the, the requirements were defined by, by our end user. It needed to be a single use, uh, completely single use flow path for the application. So right away, rotary lobes out of the mix, right? And there's some other options that are right away uh, removed. Three bar operating pressure throughout the entire run uh, this uh, this this application here was for a uh, TFF operation that we're, we're doing a cell separation for, for for a period of time through a hollow, uh, hollow fiber filtration. But a pretty good clip for flow rates, kind of at the upper edge of uh, of the 20 liter per minute um, capabilities of of all the pumps that were tested. It needed to result in uh, the, the the it needed to have a low mechanical shear measured through physical particle size as well as viable cell density. So this is one of the weird ones, right? Anyone that comes comes on, you know, there's a lot of qualitative assessments that are that are that are often tossed out there. The qualitative assessments, such as it needs to be low shear without an actual quantitative number, makes it very difficult to, to ensure that the design satisfies the requirements. So there's some companies that will come back to you and say, you know what, we need to be low shear. Well, what does that mean? And some of them can't even establish what a unit of measure is in terms of uh, shear forces. So we end up with a very difficult position to actually help them establish what the threshold is for uh, when, when the shear within the process flow path is actually detrimental to the process. It needs to be a continuous operation uh, 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 at four liters a minute after it did its initial discharge for, for 21 days. Uh, sorry, I went back to the pulsation. So it needed to have low pulsation, low spallation, um, or particulate generation, and then it needed to be an ease of use and have a low co capital and operational cost. These are, you know, this this ease of use and low capital operational cost. There's going to be capex money for a project for a brand new project that includes the the uh, the, the motors and other pieces and parts. But when it comes to the operational costs for running this business from for the next year or so, if you're running multiple batches. It becomes extremely important. 
what are the characteristics here for, for defining, you know, the, so ultimately the mean time before failure should be what in this case? Well, 21 days, uh, I don't think we want to run right on the edge of that. So, you know, ultimately we, we've run these pumps for uh, a period of time of uh, some at 45 days. Uh, recently we just finished 110 days uh, operation with the Watson Marlow pump uh, for a, for a uh, using the uh, uh, cross flow from spectrum slash replogen uh, in, a, in a perfusion cell culture process. So the testing that we've run isn't uh, necessarily um, this, I don't think you find it in a white paper from Watson Marlow. Um, it's going to be part of a test that was approved to talk about today for an, for an end user that's based out of uh, out of uh, San Francisco. So what was the test comparison? What was the, what was the pump comparison testing? Uh, what, what, did we, what did we actually run? So we ran solder mean diameter testing, which is very similar. Um, it's a uh, it utilizes utilizes an oil droplet with a with a flocculant around the outside, uh, oil and a flocculant. There's a nominal uh, uh, oil droplet size. That oil droplet size is then um, uh, you have, you establish a nominal oil droplet size. Once that's been established, then you run through the fluid flow path. The change in the overall oil droplet size over time, once it finally tapers off for a period of time, once it's stable for about 20 minutes, then that's the ultimate. Then that res results in your in your end value for your um, for the uh, for for your mechanical shear. We ran Cho cell, uh, suspension cell culture, um, viability testing, and, and hemolysis. But we ran those in, in opposite order. We ran hemolysis testing first because it's far less expensive uh, <laughs> to do than than the uh, than the Cho suspension cell cultures. We ran uh, flow curve testing across the full range, so it's full range from uh, you know um, from 99 or 98 uh, percent all the way down to two percent uh, of, of the pump's capabilities. We ran temperature testing, which is it relevant for your application? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe imparting an additional one and a half degrees C of temperature into your process stream isn't that big of a deal. Maybe it is. So understanding what the capabilities are of the system at the flow rate and the pressure that you're operating at is critical. So the heating of the equipment uh, could, be, could, could end up with a, uh, a concern for your operators. Uh, uh, heating of the process stream could be problematic to your, your product. And then heating up of the actual reservoir could make other materials that would be added in later on actually less likely or more likely to go into, uh, go into, go into solution. And then we ran through some mean time before failure testing as well. So we ran multiple pressures. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give just a few examples, but at, at, at similar pressures for the, for the quantum pump versus the, um, well not versus, but in alignment with the, uh, the QF1200 pump, the, you know, at one bar pressure at 11.67, and why do we use 11.67? Well, 11.67 was the nominal flow rate that uh, was established through uh, tests run by Levitronics through Zurich. So we use 11.67 as kind of an in industry benchmark so that we could run comparative testing for pumps that were sized and scaled to uh, zero to 20 liters per minute. So if you look at, if you look at the mechanical shear, what we started with and what we ended with, um, which is on the next slide, um, you'll see that both started at around 70 micron and then they taper off. And once they taper off and they're stable within 5%, of, uh, of of the last of the last mark for for up to 20 minutes. That's when we consider that you know that we've imparted as much mechanical shear as we could. In this example, you see that um, that it, it, from a comparative set, uh, from a comparative standpoint, the uh, the uh, Watson Marlow uh, pump from uh, the Watson Marlow pump head or the the Watson Marlow quantum pump uh, solution uh, performs. Very linearly, uh, very, uh, on a very linear fa fashion, where there's very little mechanical shear uh, generated. And if, if you look at this compared to the data that's generated from uh, from from Levitronics, it's a uh, it's it's comparable within five percent. Look at the quad flow data; it's a little bit worse, but again, goes back to is it relevant? Is this mechanical shear? Do you have enough shear sensitive media components within your process stream to maybe offset the impact of the uh, of the mechanical shear? That's being created by the process, by a filter, by a, um, by any of the other, by an agitator uh, within within the process. We ran a, a viable cell density testing. So from Levitronics uh, directly, they end up having a uh, um, they they ran testing uh, for for viable cell densities. This is a this is a, one of the, one of the tests that they conducted also uh, out of Zurich. But this this testing in of itself really bodes well for um, supporting. The previous information was the sodomy diameter testing. That what we saw is pretty close to what uh, 
what what we what we witnessed in the testing that we had conducted. So if you look at the fact that we're you know roughly within five percent ish of uh, 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 across the board between the first two pumps, which is Levitronics and the uh, and the um, Peristaltic pump, we're actually uh, that's the original testing that was run with the Masterflex uh, Peristaltic pump. The testing that we had conducted actually shows uh, even even tighter uh, range when compared to the uh, to Levitronics data. Looking at the Quadriflow data. It's very much in alignment with what uh, with what we identified as well, which is a pretty sizable uh, pretty sizable gap in terms of the amount of uh, mechanical shear imparted in the solution. A lot of data, sorry, but uh, the data is w uh, what we have. So there's no opinions; it's only information, right? So we are running the testing and mechanical shear testing uh, through the pumps, uh, and using the uh, using the quantum pump from Monte Marlo, we ran three separate waves uh, wave tests. We ran uh, three. Uh, one was a one was control. Second one was run at um, five liters a minute, and the last one was run at 15.2 liters per minute. Uh, I believe that the days that were you know 12 hours was was for each one of the tests in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, recirculated flow using um, using the, uh, uh, the 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 suspension cell culture. And as you can see on the graph, is that is that what we started with, where we, we were, where we ended with, we had um, a, a very small drop in the overall viable cell densities. Like we're, we're talking in terms of like two point, uh, I think it was 1.9 and 2.3 percent uh, uh, of, of, of in between the, uh, the the starting and ending uh, after after the runs, uh, the differentiator, differentiator. But we also have to take into consideration that the cells are also growing, right? So at the beginning. We had 1.08 here in this in this condition, and then it ended at uh, 1.24. So we're still growing because it's, the the cells aren't being uh, uh, impacted at this point so much so that it's 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 impacting the proliferation or the cell growth uh, cell growth phase. And in in the second wave, uh, as compared to the third one, you know the seeding density was 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 slightly higher, um, but again we, the, the the growth uh, didn't stop. So. It shows us uh, when, we're, when we're going through recommend, uh, recommending particular uh, equipments and, uh, and design considerations. It shows us in this in this condition here, anyways, that that the impact to uh, to suspension uh, cho cell culture is, is is negligible when when um, when using a, 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 the, the quantum peristaltic pump. Flow curve results, um, as as you would expect any uh, positive displacement pump to to react. The linearity, though, is is, is pretty substantial or pr pretty impressive that it's it's that tight across the entire range of the. Uh, 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 you would think that maybe as you approach one end or the other end, in terms of the power, uh, from the quantum pump's perspective, that it was uh, it was a uh, it was a positive or, or that you would have some a bit of trailing, and it doesn't. What this graph here does show, though, is that the pump really. Um, Really likes to pump against pressure, meaning when there's um, at, at 100 RPMs, we saw you know the, the, we looked at the um, impact of pressure on on a known flow, and uh, what the what the variability could be um, in terms of what when you when you apply uh, some back pressure. You see here that at the higher RPMs, at 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 at, at uh, one and two bar pressure, you end up with a, you know a. a, a Slightly higher spike in the overall performance. If you're running flow control, you're fine. If you're running pressure control, you'll be fine. This here ends up, um, you know, is this irrelevant for your application or not? If it is, um, then you know a, a sweet spot for your, for 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 the application and for the, that the design will satisfy. If it if it uh, if it isn't, then this doesn't become a particular design uh, element for you to uh, um, for for consideration. Pulsation. So pulsation testing, I'm, uh, I think you know, we're looking at uh, pulsation comes with a couple of other um, terrible stepchildren, right? So it comes with the uh, the vibration uh, of the equipment at times. It comes with uh, the moving moving of equipment. It comes with the inability to actually communicate from one spot to the next spot, and you know, uh, across equipment uh, from from an operator standpoint. So if you look at the pulsation here, uh, and this is a direct comparison between the uh, the uh, the quantum pump and the and the quantum flow pump. You'll see that there's uh, um, less pulsation um, at the lower pressures. Uh, so the lower pressures here are uh, actually it doesn't show up on the screen, does it? Nope. All right. So, so in the upper left-hand corner, it, this is a uh, this is the one-bar pressure test. 
Uh, it goes the top top left is one bar, bottom left is two bar, upper right is a three bar pressure. So you see as the pressure starts to, to bump up, as the pressure increases, there is a slight change uh, for for um, for the for the quantum pumps uh, performance. You'll see that for some reason uh, it's the data and this is all run in triplicate. The data as averaged out for the pump at two bar pressure, there's some artifact or you know we, we, we sometimes look at uh, um, harmonics or we look at certain um, uh, fluid paths that end up with a little bit more of a, a variability on, in terms of the pulsation but the two bar pressure we uh, we saw some wide variability in in on the quadruple and then we saw it scale back down a little bit on the on the on the three bar pressure long story short is that at the pressure if pulsation is key that you need to operate within a specific tolerance at a particular um, pressure set points and at a particular flow rate. Just understand what the what the capabilities are again, and make sure that the the, the, the pumps capabilities satisfy those process requirements. Here, um, this application was going through a hollow fiber filter, so our concerns are always transmembrane pressure and whether or not we're going to have some breakthrough, and if we end up having a larger um, a larger pressure drop, what that's ultimately going to do for our uh, our process uh, fluid stream. Ultimately, what it ended up doing for us is, is uh, having no impact. We ended up trying to, you know, we tried to do a number of things that, you know, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong on the floor. It doesn't matter how well your designs are uh, from the single use supplier side. It doesn't matter how, um, how uh, vigilant you are from the single use end user side is something is at one point or another is going to be uh, not operating exactly as you had imagined. What ends up happening here, uh, when the, uh, what ends up happening on the pulsation side, is that we, um, we tried to, you know, change this, change the inlet suction. We try, tried to uh, change the net positive suction head uh, pressure. We tried to uh, change not only the discharge pressure, but we also went through some, uh, uh, through some uh, reducers and largers uh, to to make to make it a torturous path to see what are the conditions by which, but. Based off of the type of pump it is, uh, for, uh, for both the the quaternary uh, pump from uh, Quattroflow and the and the the peristaltic pump from uh, uh, the quantum pump from Watson Marlin, they, they both they both you know pull, pull through very well. Uh, and, but you can see that if if you the wide variability in pulsation is is uh, could be problematic. Test results for the for the temperature. Um, again, this is uh, over time uh, re re recirculated um, uh, process material in through the, the pump head. We just we run processes where at, at times uh, plus or minus 0.1 degrees is the normal operating range, operating range, and 0.2 degrees is the uh, process acceptable range. So would this be important over time? It would be, but if you have something jacketed then you just have to tune the jackets of what you're recirculating out of rights in order to overcomp in order to compensate for whatever the temperature that was imparted to the solution was. So ultimately, again, this is just data to uh, from a consideration perspective that you would need to evaluate prior to making a, making a, a, a pump selection. Perfusion capabilities. So this is one that, uh, that we had run not on behalf of, of any, um, of any uh, supplier, uh, but we did this uh, testing on behalf of, uh, of an end user. So it's just a regular traditional flow path um, using uh, hollow fiber filtration. Uh, in this case, we used the cross flow uh, from, from Replogen uh, with the, uh, all, the, all the process data is included in here. Ultimately, though, as we ran the testing, um, they, were they were originally using a Masterflex uh, pump setup, uh, which is uh, on a smaller scale. I think it was one of Spectrum's initial offerings. And it just wasn't. It, it, there was slippage. There was uh, there was slippage on the uh, on the on the tubing that was being used. There was a multitude of, of um, integrity breaches. So they wanted a solution that didn't change necessarily the the pump mechanism, but they wanted to change the or pump type or style. They wanted to just go with a, with an alternative. So the alternative here, in terms of the way that, uh, in terms of the testing, was the uh, ultimately was the. Uh, um, was a quantum pump uh, from from Watson Marla. but if you look at the, you know, we ran two separate tests for this for for one end user that uh, one used Cho cells, another one used the uh, the HEK cell line, so a hidden human kidney cell. Um, viabilities I think are important to look at here in, in terms of the fact that we had um, 
we had 10 million cells on one and we had 40 million cells on the other. A lot of the new cell culture work out there is really transitioning from kind of the smaller scale or the smaller, smaller uh, viable cell densities that are like between four to 10 uh, million cells per ml to this uh, 40 to 60 million cells in, or in greater. Uh, is what the what the changes anyways for for us in, in terms of what our evaluations are have started to transition into looking at um, looking at the viability change over time the the, the, the viability uh, from the from the max viability rate was 94 percent on the on the one that lasted for eight days at a higher flow rate 21 days at the uh, at the lower flow rate so ultimately you can see here that we had 21 days worth of solid data if you look at the published data set that comes from Watson Marlow on, their, uh, on, the, on the quantum pump itself, uh, I think the max time, if somebody wants to correct me on this, I think it's 24 hours at three bar pressure at 20 liters per minute, something like that. It, for this test, we did 21 days at a, at, a, at a moderate flow rate. We just finished 110 days at, a, at, at seven and a half liters a minute. So seven and a half liters a minute for 110, um, 110 days was a pretty, uh, so we're looking at things in terms of like contingent operation. How much further could have we gone? I don't know. We ran out of media, so we kept running and running and running. The product was was you know we we had we had we had envisioned based off this uh, CDMO opportunity that we would go for about 90 days. We we're at 110 days using this pump, and uh, we still could have gone even longer. So the mean time before failure at a particular flow rate and temperature and pressure for this for this pump. Um, has not been established yet. So I can only say that at seven liters a minute, 110 days is absolutely achievable. Um, whereas, whereas uh, I think again, I think the published data is uh, 24 hours at 200 or 20 liters a minute. So um, this this is all valuable to my end user because if I only went off of what was provided in the data sheet or in a white paper or in a validation package, I'm going to automatically just take that and and put it aside because it wouldn't have met. We run the testing. Based off of the, based off of what our understanding is of the components' capabilities and how they can satisfy our users' requirements, and now this is going to, this is this is their option. Same thing for, I know I have a lot of focus here on, on cell culture. Um, the pump, from my understanding, on the uh, from Watson Marlow uh, on the quantum side was originally developed for downstream operations. So it's it developed primarily for chromatography, for depth filtration, well, chromatography for dead end filtration steps. Uh, TFF applications, but you know it's 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 like anything, right? The minute that you have a a, a product and somebody launches a new product, everybody wants you know people will find other ways on how to use it. Same thing with the end user. The minute that you receive a process or go on a process development uh, uh, opportunity, you always want something a little bit smaller, a little bit larger, a little bit hotter, a little bit colder, something that works a little bit longer or doesn't make any difference at all. So ultimately, this 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 perfusion run that we ended up going through ended up with a uh, with a, with a whole bunch of data where if you look at the way that the flow path was set up compared to the flow path that was set up for the temperature testing from before some key characteristics that that don't artificially inflate any of the data or the information but need to be taken into consideration is the length of the tubing that you're recirculating from right so if you're recirculating back to a reservoir and only had uh, 10 liters in the reservoir and uh, a, f a foot of tubing on the inlet and the outlet going through the pump head and you increase the temperature by two and a half degrees. Well, this whole flow path here was roughly um, 70 inches of tubing. So now I'm using the room more as a heat exchanger. I'm able to dissipate some of the temperature that may have been imparted from the, uh, from the actual operation. And then what ends up happening? This becomes a nothing. It's a, no it's, it's, it's a non-starter. But understanding that it could happen, doing running the challenge testing allows us to be able to provide that data back to our back to our end users. Conclusion. So evaluating the single-use pump technologies, um, you, know, you have to ensure the requirements have been established um, and are relevant. Using terms like, uh, you know, it needs to be lower mechanical shear, it has to have, I, I think one of the terms out there is uh, trace pulsation. I'm not sure if there's a measurement of uh, trace pulsation anywhere out there, but I'm not sure what that means. That just to one end user, it's going to be plus or minus 0.1 psi. Another company is going to look at trace pulsation as a, uh, as a plus or minus one bar. So you have to look at this from from establishing. That's what I mean uh, on behalf of the of the relevance requirements. They have to be relevant. They have to be something that you can 
touch, something that you can measure against, something that has some degree of traceability to it so that you can ultimately provide a, um, a solution that satisfies those requirements. If they don't have it, and a lot of companies don't, uh, so if you're a supplier or you're on your end user side, you might think that your process requires, oh, I just need something to move materials at uh, 200 liters a minute. Okay. Is it important to have, uh, have it not blow up uh, the tubing if you end up with a kink? Well, if that's the case, then maybe a possible displacement pump's not the option. Maybe the centrifugal pump's an option. But really working with the suppliers, really working with the end users to ensure that all the identified requirements have been established will make everybody's life a lot easier. Ensuring that the quality business and technical evaluations are conducted prior to the selection. So even, this goes back to the, the, the point I was trying to make with the fact that even though you might have the most technically savvy or technically appropriate uh, piece of equipment, if you, if you can't purchase it or if you have a bad supply chain or if you have, uh, it's coming from a small town that only has, you know, the, the next horse and buggy carriage out with the raw materials that you need in order for to make this component. All of these characteristics, we would never recommend anything to an end user that didn't have, um, that did not have a robust uh, supply chain. And then on the quality side, understanding where the quality is coming from, who has it, who, who, what testing has already been uh, has already occurred. One thing I didn't want to get into in this in this uh, in this in this pump conversation what had anything to do necessarily with the E and L side and the single use uh, components in and of themselves, because that's its own. That's its own bailiwick. This is its own, you know, on the senior pump side, it's really the motive, it's the mechanism, it's the type, it's the supplier of, of, of the pumps that are really in, in, in that criticality right now. But ultimately, if there was a mean by time before failure, failure that happened after a minute, then we would do root cause analysis down to, is it the supplier, is it the raw material, is it the chemical exposure? Is it the pressure, the flow rate, the temperature? We would go down into the, into the other details, but we should already have a complete list of what those uh, uh, parameters are, what those variables are, so that we can manage those independent variables, control, uh, have full control over the process stream, and be able to deliver a solution that's, uh, that, that, that satisfies our, our, uh, the requirements. Again, uh, just not to overstate it, but uh, every pump that's been tested, whether it's you know whether it's the Levitronix pump, the the uh, Quattroflow pump, and, and the uh, Watson Marlow uh, Quantum pump, everyone has its merits, has, has its place, has its application. There are some, there are some, certainly some bookends though uh, that that we uh, bookends meaning that there are uh, certain characteristics that one pump shares that several of the other pumps do not. So if you're looking for a uh, single use pump manufacturer, a positive displacement pump that goes 0 to 20 liters a minute. There's a couple of good options out there. Ones that don't destroy the cells during a, uh, der uh, one that goes to the same flow rate that uh, doesn't destroy cells at 17 liters a minute. There's a good option out there. <laughs> one, you know, one that goes 22 liters a minute and, 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 uh, 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 and is positive displacement. There's really an option out there, but one that goes 22 liters a minute and doesn't impact the cell culture, I really can't provide you an option for that. So this is, this is the basis by which we do our testing. This is the, uh, the, uh, the, the data set um, that supports uh, why it is when we make a selection. We use this data to, to go back to our end users as a, this is our starting point, let's feed in all the data, and then based off of this information, if it has its merits, we will run through and we'll take, a, we'll take, a, we'll, we'll take the industry options and we'll run, in, we'll run into ground. I think there's something to be said, though, about, you know, I think we've all used a peristaltic pump in our life. I think we've all, um, at one point or another, we, we trust in its, in its capabilities. There's, there, there's, a, there's been a paradigm shift there with the quantum pump uh, in terms of going from a, a dual roller to not a dual roller, to keeping our pulsation down, to keeping the particulate generation down and spallation down. I think there's something to be said about that. I think uh, there's something to absolutely be said about I, I, if I if I've if I've watched water fill and drain um, uh, in my life for about six months straight. It's probably if I were to take all the times that I've spent watching materials move from spot to spot. There's really only a few options that are above 150 liters a minute that are in the market to to, to move things from point A to point B. The, the benefits. Uh, the benefits and the design elements for consideration are all out there. Sometimes it's teasing out the data 
from that's been provided from the supplier. Sometimes it's running the testing yourself in a in a controlled application so that you're not trying to satisfy a large group of, of, of end users, but more of a targeted, uh, single focused, laser focused uh, 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 end user. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, um, just looking at uh, some of my side notes here. Yeah, um, I guess one other thing, I'm, it has not, yeah, it, self priming. Uh, self priming nature of, uh, of, of some of these pumps is, is very, you know, it, it, certainly important. Being able to pull, you know, a, a far length of, uh, of tubing or far, far uh, uh, process stream from a far, from an empty piece of tubing, 80 feet. Um, some of the, you know, some of our end users um, are trying to do this with only um, two feet of, uh, of of head pressure. Some pumps that work well for, other pumps that won't work well for. Maybe you don't have downstream pressure. Some of these pumps don't work. Some of them do. So we end up making sure that we take all the considerations and characteristics in, in uh, all the characteristics of what the pump's capabilities are and we, we put that into a package and that goes out to our end users for making uh, material or equipment selection. That's it for now. Are there any questions? The difference was is that when we were running the testing initially, the one, the one test, um, this, uh, this test here, with the, this, this was not in a jacketed vessel. So when we're running the recirculation on the perfusion testing uh, on, the, on the 110 days and the, and the 21 days test, that, that was actually in a vessel that had a, temp had a, had a water jacket. So that uh, we had no excursion in, in temperature whatsoever. We would have, you know, if you look at the data set, we would pull the pull the, the data historian on that on that testing. What what you know, it would it would so some companies will drop their their overall temperature of the cell culture by a couple of degrees as they're doing their harvesting. But since we're running it for such a long period of time, 110 days, mm -hmm. if we did that, we would end up with far less uh, product coming out as well. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to we didn't want to go through the point of, uh, of, of 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 running lower. And then sometimes if you run a little bit lower, it actually provides a more robust cell line. Okay. So then that could actually artificially inflate the data too. So we're consistently at the 36 and a half degrees for the entire run. Okay. And just as a follow up to that, um, so what about your cell viability? Was that constant during yeah, the? So cell viability for the for the 110 days, we expect you know we have a we have a growth curve and a death curve. So we have we do uh, uh, we do some LDH work. Uh, so we're measuring. So we are understanding on how the uh, the, the cells are 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 uh, the cell expansion works. But ultimately, we uh, the the transition criteria to go into the next step and to stop everything was 75% uh, viability. We never got below eighty six percent so we we maintained one hundred and ten days at, then the, it was starting to wane, but that wasn't i I think it was the cells i, I don't think it wasn't the, the equipment wasn't starting to break down it was the the cell line just wasn't uh, wasn't robust beyond it wasn't you know it, it it had gone a number of generations beyond its uh, beyond its uh, life expectancy all right thank you all for attending. <laughs>